Okay. Uh, sorry for anyone that was expecting um, my uh, streams on Monday through Wednesday. Um, as I'm sure a lot of people know, um, Texas, where I live, has handled the freeze, the winter storm, very poorly. We lost power at about 12.30 in the morning on Saturday, on Monday. And had about, and a couple of hours later got it back for about 45 minutes. Then it went out. And then for a solid, from, it was out again, it went out at 12.30. Came back at 7.30 went out again at 8.15, came back at 12.30 in the afternoon, went out again at 12.45, and didn't come back on until sometime in the afternoon, after probably after dark, on Tuesday. Don't worry, as you can see by me being back, we have power. We do have water. It is slow because the city, the city's water, the city itself, the water mains froze. Um, as far as we know, there have been no burst pipes. But we do have we do have water slowing as it is. Um, I'm actually probably about to go outside and grab some. After this, I'm gonna probably go grab some snow and let it melt to fill the toilet because it wasn't filling but that's a yeah it's been a rough week and on top of that it was my roommate's birthday yesterday yeah so her birthday celebrations have been delayed exponentially we were looking at Friday potentially but it's actually probably going to be closer to to next week sometime <laughs> after the weather clears up but we personally are doing okay our cats are okay we took refuge at um, my roommate's parents' house in Lindale. Um, getting my sim going. Um, but yeah, that's all the announcements. Um, we are back in business for now. Um, yeah. So. Once again, going to be reading, and this will actually be because they're only, I want to say they're only 15, yeah, they're only 15 chapters. So this is going to be the last session with dealing with dragons. We are at the home stretch. Um, Next up, I will st I will actually next time start reading um, Sorry.
trying to remember where I had her sitting. filling up her queue. Okay. But yeah, um, so like I was saying, next week I will actually, instead of reading The Witcher, I will read, um, I'll be alternating between reading a pre-established published book and reading a fan fiction. So um, I will probably start with, I'm most likely going to start with my, um, one of, it's actually one of my most popular fan fictions on Archive of Our Own. Uh, on AO3 right now. Um, it is called The Misadventures, Misadventures of Catastrophe. It is a Miraculous Ladybug rewrite. It's um, not necessarily a rewrite, it's just an AU where Adrian's not the cat hero. It's Chloe. And she took the hero name Catastrophe. So, okay, that's literally all my announcements. Um, yeah. Get her. Another couple of. Chapter 13, and also, um, forgive me if my voice sounds a little bit scratch, if my voice, about my voice being a little bit scratchy, um, with the weather, I am feeling kind of a little bit under the weather. I'm okay. <sighs> my sinuses are just acting up. Chapter 13, in which Alionora discovers an unexpected use for soap and water, and Cimmerine has, a, has difficulty with the dragon. Antarell looked past Cimmerine and Alionora as if they were not there, and spoke directly to the stone prince. I told my father someone was listening. He won't be happy when he finds out I was right, but he'll feel better when I tell him I've taken care of things. He might even let me have the first look in the king's, king's crystal once Warog gives it to us. So that's what you're after, Cimmerine said. Antarell favored her with a superior smile. Quite right, Princess Cimmerine. The king's crystal will show us whereabouts of every piece of useful and interesting magic in the world. All we'll have to do is go out and pick them up. Somehow I don't think that'll it'll be that easy, Cimmerine murmured. We knew Tokos would never give it to us, but Warog will, as soon as he's king of the dragons. He'll have to, or we'll tell everyone how we were the ones who made sure he was the new king. Of course, we can't afford to have anybody around who might make awkward revelations. I doubt the dragons will listen to a couple of hysterical princesses, but he... Interrell pointed at the stone prince. 
will have to go. What are you going to do? Eleonora demanded. She was plainly frightened, and Cimmerine could see that her knuckles were white with the force of her grip on the handle of the scrub bucket. Oh, gravel seems appropriate, don't you think? Enterelle said. No one will notice a few more rocks around here. Ought I to be taking this person seriously? The stone prince said in a rather doubtful tone. You'd better if you don't want to end up as a lot of little pebbles, Eleonora answered. She still sounded frightened, but she seemed to be getting a grip on herself. He's a wizard. You wouldn't be ta talking about gravel if you were the one who had to sweep the floor, Sabrine said to Antrell. <sighs> she stepped forward as she spoke, hoping to get between Antrell and the stone prince before Antrell noticed what she was doing. She didn't think Antrell was a good enough wizard to do any real harm, but there was no point in taking chances. Stay where you are, Princess Sabrine, Antrell commanded. I'll deal with you in a moment. Must you be so theatrical? Samarine said. Theatrical? You think I'm being theatrical? Antarell said furiously. I am simply showing a proper respect for the importance of this moment. You're showing off, Samarine said flatly. And you're not doing it very well. He doesn't sound much like a wizard to me, the stone prince said. Is he always like this? Enough! Antero cried raised, and raised his staff. Light shimmered along its length and began to gather at the lower end. Grinning wolfishly, the wizard tilted the staff, aiming it towards the stone prince. Stop that! Eleonora said. Antero ignored it. Ignored her. I said, stop it! Eleonora shouted and threw her bucket at Antero's head. Eleonora's aim was off. The bucket hit Antero's shoulder. A bolt of fire shot from the end of his staff and whizzed between Samarine and the Stone Prince to strike the far wall with a whumping noise and a shower of sparks. Antarell staggered, slipped in the cascade of soapy water, and fell over the bucket, dropping his staff in the process. Samarine darted in and kicked Antarell's staff out of his reach. He stared up at her uh, from a mound of soggy silk and soap suds. You can't do this to me, he shrieked. Something in his voice made Samarine and her friends look at him more closely. Eleonora's eyes went wide and Samarine blinked in surprise. He's, he's collapsing, Eleonora said in a stunned voice. He's melting, Samarine corrected her. I can't be melting, Santorell cried. I'm a wizard. It's not fa- His head disappeared in a small brown puddle and his cries stopped. There was a moment of astonished silence. I thought it was witches who melt when you dump water over them. The stone prince said at last. It is, usually, Samarine said. What on earth did you put in that bucket, Eleanor? <laughs> Just water and soap and a little lemon juice to make it smell nicer, Eleanor said. Um, said Samarine, thinking hard. <sighs> I'll bet there's a simpler way of melting wizards, but we don't have time right now to figure out what it is. How many buckets can you hold in, get hold of in a hurry? Buckets? Eleonora said, two counting this one. And I suppose I could borrow one from Halana. That's three. And I've got two in the kitchen, and I expect the iron kettle, kettle is big enough. That's six altogether. Two for each of us. You will help, won't you? Simmerine added, turning to the stone prince. Of course, the prince assured her. Help with what? <laughs> He's so oblivious. I love him. Stopping those wizards, Simarine said. We can't let them make Warog the next king of the dragons by trickery. I don't see how we can stop them, Eleonora said. We can't possibly get to the Fort of Whispering Snakes before the trial starts. 
And even if we could, we don't know where the wizards will be hiding. If we tell the dragons that Warog's trying to cheat, they'll stop the trials, Samarine said with more confidence than she felt. That will give us time to find the wizards. And I've got a way to get us to the ford. You go start collecting buckets. I'll meet you at your place after I get the things I'll need from Kazool's. What about... Eleonora gestured with distaste at the wet, messy lump of groves at the center of the puddle that was all that remained of Antero. We'll clean it up when we get back, Samarine said. This is more important. Eleonora nodded, and the three left the banquet room. The stone prince decided to accompany Eleonora since he was not as a fast walker and Samarine had farther to go. Samarine left them, and when they reached the main tunnel and ran back to Gazul's cave. There she went straight to her room and opened the drawer where she kept odds and ends. In the back left hand corner, carefully wrapped in a handkerchief, were the three black feathers she had taken from the, beneath the left wing of the bird she had killed in the enchanted forest. She shoved the whole packet into her pocket without bothering to unwrap it and went on to the kitchen to collect the, her buckets. <coughs> Then she hurried through the tunnels to Florox Cave, where Alianora and the Stone Prince were waiting. When Samarine arrived, she found the Stone Prince pumping water to fill Alianora's third bucket while Alianora mixed soap and lemon juice into the second. Samarine set her pots and pails next to the pump and went to help Alianora. Now what? Alianora said when, they, when all the buckets were full of the cleaning mixture. Samarine reached into her pocket and dug out the package. Gently, she unfolded the handkerchief and removed one of the feathers. Noticing as she did, that the package also contained the pebble she, that she had picked up in the Caves of Fire and Night. If we each take two buckets, we can still link elbows without spilling too much. Can we still link elbows without spilling too much? She asked. Alianora and the Stone Prince looked at each other, shrugged, and picked up two buckets each. Simmerine took the last bucket in the iron pot. Holding the handle of the pot with only three fingers so she could keep a grip on the feather with her thumb and forefinger. Hello, random viewer. Ah. A series of awkward maneuvers followed as Alianora and the Stone Prince tried to link elbows with Simmerine without losing their balance or dropping one of their buckets. In the process, Simmerine's skirt got soaked. It's a good thing I'm not a wizard, Simmerine said. Ready? Here we go. She twisted her hand toward the edge of the iron pot and let go of the black feather. I wish we were at the Ford of Whispering Snakes, she said as the feather fall fell and the room dissolved around them. They materialized in, at the very edge of a river on, flat, on a flat, narrow rock that jutted out over the water and Alianora immediately slipped on the wet stone. If the stone prince had not been so solid and heavy, all three of them would have fallen into the river. As it was, it took Samarine and Alianora several seconds to regain their balance. When she was finally sure of her footing, Samarine breathed a sigh of relief and quickly looked about her. The fort of Whispering Snakes was crowded. Dragons of all sizes and shades of green lined the banks of the river and filled the spaces beneath the towering trees of the enchanted forest. On the far bank, a pale dragon was poring over a parchment list that Simmerine thought she remembered seeing during one of the many errands she had run the previous night. All the dragons seemed to be talking at once, and none of them noticed Simmerine and her friends. Hello, dragons! Simmerine shouted, trying to make herself heard above the noise. Here now, what's all this? An olive green dragon on the bank demanded, turning. Someone's trying to sneak a look at the trials. Sneaks. Hissed a soft but nonetheless clearly audible voice from somewhere near Simmerine's feet. Simmerine jumped and looked down, but though she craned her neck to see all around her, she could not find the second speaker. Get rid of them before Trom comes back with the with Colin's stone, another dragon advised. 
We aren't trying to sneak in, and we don't care about watching the trials, Simarine said, wishing she dared to look around for Kazul. We came to warn you about the wizards. The wizards. The soft voice echoes. Wizards, the olive green dragon said skeptically. There aren't any wizards here. No, but they figured out some way of interfering with your choice of the next king, Simarine said. They're hiding somewhere. You have to put off the trial with Colin Stone until we find them and stop them. If you'll just tell Kazul we're here. Put off the trials, the olive green dragon interrupted. Impossible. They've been underway for half an hour. We can't just stop in the middle. Who are you people anyway? A flicker of motion caught Samarine's eyes, and she looked down just in time to see a thin red snake dart from one clump of weed to the next. Sneaks, whispered the soft voice an instant later. Sneaks and wizard, wizards. I wasn't asking you, the dragon said severely in the general direction of the snake. And whatever they are, they certainly aren't wizards. They look some like somebody's princesses to me, a blue green dragon said. Pity that. It would be so much simpler to eat them and get them out of the way. Are you sure? Said a third dragon. The one on the end doesn't look like a princess. I'm beginning to think this wasn't such a good idea, the stone prince said. He may not be a prison princess, but he doesn't look edible either, the blue green dragon pointed out. But these other two are definitely princesses. You can't go eating them out of hand. Princesses. Hissed the voice from under the rock. Oh, princesses, the old green dragon said. No wonder they're full, so full of wild tales. It's true, Simarine said desperately. If you don't believe us, take us to Kazul. She will. I can't do that. The olive green dragon said, Kozul's third in line now, after Ma Mazarin and Warog. You can't talk to people who are that close to making their attempt with the stone. It would distract them. Warog, Eleonora said, Warog's next in line? Yes, he should be starting off any minute now, said the olive dra green dragon. Then comes Mazarin, and then Kozul. I don't expect it will take long, though. Nobody's carried the stone for more than a mile or two yet. But I'm Kazul's princess, Simarine cried. Simarine said. I don't care who you are, the dragon said, re replied crossly. You can't talk to Kazul until she's done with her turn. That will be too late, Simarine cried. You don't understand Warog and the wizards. I've had enough of your wizards, the olive green dragon said. You're a confounded nuisance, and you ought not be pushing your way in here where you're not wanted. Go away. Simarine, what are we going to do? Eleonora said as the olive green dragon turned and stalked determinedly away. At Hero School, we were always taught that if you couldn't persuade someone to help you with something, it meant that you were supposed to do it by yourself, the stone prince said diff diffidently. And we are prepared. He lifted one of the buckets slightly. But we don't know where the wizards are, Eleonora said. We have to find them before we can stop them, and there isn't time. Stop the wizards, whispered the soft, whispered the soft voice. That's the first sensible thing you've said since we got here, Simarine said to the hissing whisper. Can't you just wish to be where the wizards are? The, the prince, stone prince, asked Simarine. No, you have to know where you're going or the math spell doesn't work, Simarine said. For a moment, all three were glumly silent. Simarine stared at the water, remembering how and where she got, had gotten the feathers. Suddenly, she raised her head. We may not know where the wizards are, but I'll be, bet some, I know someone who can find out. Hold this for a minute. Simarine handed one of her buckets to Eleonora, then dug out the packet of feathers. She pulled the second feather from the, po from the po packet 
and grabbed Eleonora's elbow. Hold tight, everybody. I wish we were at Morwen's house, Cimmerian said and dropped the feather. The scenery shifted abruptly, and they were standing on Morwen's porch. The house was just as tidy looking as Cimmerian mem remembered, and the porch floor gleamed as if it had just been washed. A black and white cat, startled by their sudden appearance, fell off the porch railing. Four others left off washing themselves to stare at Cimmerian with unwinking green, green and yellow eyes. I need to talk to Morwen, Cimmerian said to the cats. It's an emergency. A lean tiger-striped cat, striped cat rose and oozed through a crack in the door. Cats are liquid. Serene unwound herself from Eleanor and the Stone Prince and set her buckets on the porch floor. I hope this works. She muttered to herself as Eleanor and the Prince placed their buckets beside hers. Ah. Sorry. Chapter 14, in which the wizards try to make trouble and Cimmerine does something about it. <sighs> the door of the cottage opened and Morwen stepped out. What sort of emergency? She asked. She studied in the stone prints for a moment, then peered at Cimmerine over the tops of her glasses and added with some severity. I hope you weren't referring to his predicament. He may, may well find it an inconvenience, but it certainly isn't an emergency, not by my standards, anyway. No, said Cimmerine. I was talking about the wizards. They've poisoned the king of the dragons, and now they're trying to interfere with Colin Stone so that Warog will be the new king. We have to stop them, but we don't know where they are. And Warog's going to try to carry, try to carry the stone any minute. Can you find them for us? Morwen blinked twice and shoved her glasses back into place with her forefinger. I see, she said. You're right, it's an emergency. I'll do what I can, but if you don't tell me the whole story later, then there's a bit more time. When there's a bit more time, I shall. I, I, shall, I shall turn you all into mice and give you to the cats. Wait here. <laughs> As she spoke, more wind disappeared into the house. She reappeared a moment later, holding a small mirror and muttered over it. Colin Stone, she said, and, the, and, sh and breathed on the glass. She looked up. Any wizards in particular? Ziminar, the head wizard of the Society of Wizards. Simmerine said, wishing more wind could, would go faster and knowing she couldn't. I should have guessed. <sighs> more wind said, she turned back to the mirror. Ziminar, she said, and breathed on the glass once more. Then she motioned to Cimmerine to come and look. Cimmerine obeyed, and Eleanor and the stone prince crowded closely behind her. The mirror showed a blurry, wavering picture of the Fort of Whispering Snakes. As Cimmerine watched, the picture moved slowly along the bank, one bank of the river, past the waiting dragons in the immense trees of the enchanted forest and on down the river. Can't it go any faster? Eleanor whispered. There's no need to whisper, and no, it can't, Morwen said. Not if you want to be sure of finding the wizards of yours on the first try. And it doesn't sound as if you have time to waste on mistakes. The picture in the mirror continued to creep along the bank. Cimmerine pulled the third and last feather out of her pocket and brushed it nervously across her fingers while she waited. What's that? The stone prince said suddenly. The mirror picture stopped, then moved up the bank away from the river toward a thicket of blackberry brambles. Cimmerine saw the tip of a wooden staff poking up above the thicket. Tensely, she waited for the mirror to show them the far side of the brambles. It's them! Eleonora said. She sounded frightened and excited at the same time. Oh, dear. Cimmerine took a good look at the picture in the mirror. Five wizards were standing in an opening between, behind the blackberry thicket, leaning on their staffs and looking at the sky. 
Suddenly, one of the wizards pointed. The other with others peered upward, nodded, and they raised their staffs. Get the buckets, Simmerine said. Cats scattered in all directions as the stone prints pounded across the porch behind, behind Simmerine and Eleonora. Hang on, here we go. I wish, not without me, Morwen said, grabbing Simmerine's shoulder. We were at the blackberry thicket where the wizards are. Simmerine said and dropped the feather. Don't! Morwen finished as the porch blinked out and was replaced by the blackberries. The five wizards were standing in an arc just in front of the bramble. Each of them held his staff so that the lower end was about a foot above the ground, pointing at something hidden in the moss at their feet. An unpleasant yellow-green light dripped from the ends of the staffs, and the moss where the wizards were standing was brown and dead. The wizards' backs were toward Simmerine and her friends. Now, Simmerine cried. As the wizards began to turn, she set one of her buckets on the ground and lifted the other in both hands. Taking careful aim, she flung the soapy water at a, over a black-haired wizard in the center of the ark. Charge! yelled the stone prince and threw one of his buckets at the nearest wizard. Take that, you cheats, said Alianora, dumping the first of her buckets over another. <sighs> what? This is impossible, said one of the wizards indignantly as he began to melt. Too bad, Simmerine said, throwing her second load of water at the second next to last wizard. Watch where you're throwing that. Morwen said to the stone prince who had sloshed his stone bucket over the fifth wizard with such enthusiasm that water sprayed in all directions. Sorry, the prince apologized. Is that all of them? It's all five of the ones we saw, Serene said cautiously. Then we did it, Alionora said. Not quite, said Ziminar, stepping out of the bushes behind Morwen. You interrupted the spell, of course, but we weren't nearly finished anyway. And as long as the stone remains enchanted, Warog won't have any trouble getting it all the way to the Banishing Mountain. Look. He pointed it with his staff, and Simmerine saw three dragons high in the air, flying steadily towards the mountains. One of them had a long black stone clutched in his claws, and the other two appeared to be escorting him at a careful distance. Warog and the two judges, Simmerine murmured. Ziminar nodded. You might as well put that bucket down, he went on, turning to Alionora. You can't throw it at me without melting your witch friend here. What's in it, by the way? I don't see why we should tell you, Simmerine said as Alionora set the last six buckets down. Because I'm interested, princess, Ziminar said with an oily spine. And we will pass the time until the next shift gets here. And I can decide what to do with you. If you're that interested, why don't you take a closer look? Said the stone prince, picking up Alianora's bucket. Stay where you are, Zivinar commanded. As he spoke, he raised his staff and sidestepped so that Morwen was between him and the stone prince. If you insist said the prince. He shrugged, lifted the bucket, and flung the water over Morwen and Ziminar at the same time. What? No! Ziminar cried in horror as he began to melt. Not soap suds! It's demeaning! There's a little lemon juice in it, too, Alionora offered. Ziminar glared at her. He was less than half his normal height and shrinking as they watched. Well, a dark puddle spread out beneath him. Lemon juice? Bah! How dare you do such a thing? I'm the head wizard of the Society of Wizards. His voice grew fainter and higher as he shrank. Interfering busybodies, soap sets of all the dignified tricks. You'll be sorry for this. You can't melt a wizard forever, you know. You'll be sorry. The wizard's voice ceased. All that remained of him was a pile of silk robes and a long wooden staff lying on some damp moss. Eleanor and Cimmerine stared for a moment, then Eleanor turned to the stone prince. 
I'm glad he's gone, she said. But how could you melt Morwen just to get the wizard? But I didn't, the stone prince said. Look. Samarine and Alionora turned. Morwen seemed no shorter than usual, though she certainly looked very damp. She had taken off her glasses and was shaking water off them. Don't just stand there, she said crossly to Samarine. Hand me a dry handkerchief. Just a minute. Samarine said, checking her pockets. She found the handkerchief that had been wrapped around the magic feathers and handed it to Morwen. Um, why didn't you, why didn't you melt? Clean living, Morwen said as she began to dry her glasses on Samarine's handkerchief. I thought as much, the stone prince said in a satisfied tone. Nobody who lives in a house as clean as yours could possibly melt in a bucket of soap suds. Quite right, Morwen said approvingly. You have a good head on your shoulders, young man. What's this? She held up a sharp-edged pack of black pebble. It's a piece of stone I found in the caves of fire and night, Simrine said. Where exactly? In the king's cave, Simrine said. Morwen, shouldn't we do something about that spell Zeminar mentioned? Eleanor was watching the sky, shaking her, sh shading her eyes with her hand. Grog's nearly halfway to the mountain, she said anxiously. Good, said Morwen, though neither Simmerine nor Alianora could tell which of them she was talking to. The witch shook her wet robes and walked over to the patch of dead moss where the wizards had been working, picking her way carefully past the little piles of robes and staffs. Simmerine followed. In the center of the brown area was a black stone the size of Simmerine's fist. A web of yellow-green light flickered across its smooth surface. Sloppy, Morwen said. Very sloppy. Though I'm not surprised. Wizards have always seem always seem to depend on the brute force when a little subtlety would be far more effective. She fingered Simmerine's pebble for a moment, then reached out and dropped it on top of this wizard's stone. There was a noise like a great deal of popcorn all popping at once and the light that flickered over the black stone spat yellow-green sparks on all directions. Eleanor jumped and backed away. Simmerine would have liked to do the same, but she did not want to give Morwen a bad impression of her courage, so she stayed where she was. The sparks died and the flickering light went out. From the sky high above came a faint shriek of surprise and rage. Samarine looked up and saw three black specks in the sky. Two, no, not three, four. And the two escort dragons were swooping to catch the speck that was Colin Stone, which Warog had just dropped. Samarine gave a sigh of relief and not looked at Morwen. So much for Warog and the wizards, she said. We didn't even need the fireproofing spell. What did you do? And what happens now? Eleonora added. Duck, said Morwen and threw herself sideways into the bushes. What? said the stone prince. And then he and Simmerine and Eleonora were engulfed in a blast of dragon fire. The stone prince leaped in front of the two princesses, but he was much too late to protect them. Fortunately, the spire fireproofing spell was still in effect, and neither of them even felt warm. Though Eleonora lost the ends of her sleeves and Simmerine's hemline rose six scorched inches. I knew I shouldn't have said that about the fireproofing spell, Simmerine muttered. With a wordless snarl and a thunder of wings, Warog landed just in front of the little group. You! He shouted at Simmer when he saw Simmerine. I might have known it would be you! flame shot from his mouth once more, but it was just as useless as it had been the first time. Simrine glanced up and saw one of the escort dragons spiraling down when he, to see what was going on. You might as well give up, Warog, she said, hoping to distract the angry dragon long enough for help to arrive. You can't be any of the dragons now. I'll tear you limb from limb! Warog rage, every last one of you. One arm shot out as he spoke, shining silver claws snapped around the stone prince's waist. Alionora screamed. 
Hurry up! Simmerine shouted at the dragon in the sky. The dragon heard and dove toward them, but he was not fast enough. Warog shoved the stone prince into his mouth and bit down hard. An instant later, he howled in pain and spat out the prince in two and four teeth. What is all this? said the escort dragon, landing carefully beside Warog. The clearing was getting rather crowded. A plot to cheat to th on the test to see who the next king of the dragons will be. Simmerine said. Warog was in it, and a lot of wizards. Are you all right? Eleonora asked the stone prince, who was just picking himself up. His stone was black in places from the dragon fire, but otherwise he seemed unhurt, more or less. But just look what that fire did to my clothes, and that dragon's put a chip in my sleeve. What am I supposed to do about that? It's not as if I can just change clothes when I get home, you know. That's ridiculous, the escort dragon told Simmerine. No dragon would cooperate with wizards. I don't see any wizards either. I think you're making it up. Of course you don't see any wizards, Simmerine said, feeling very cross. We melted them. Melted them? Where do you think those staffs came from? Simmerine said, point pointed at the wizard's staffs lying across the scattered brown puddles. The dragon backed up a pace and sniffed experimentally. It's all quite true, Morwen said, poking her head out of the bushes. And we'll be more than happy to explain the whole thing to your new king as soon as you have one. Provided, of course, that you take that maniac away before he burns the whole enchanted forest to the ground, she gestured at Warog. Simmerine, I really must insist on getting a copy of that fireproofing spell. It will clearly be worth every minute of the months of hunting it will take me to find some hen's teeth. And I may as well get started as soon as I can. Who's that? said the escort dragon. Morwen. That does it. This is too much for me. I'm taking you all into custody until the trials are over and the king can sort it out. Come along. I assume that doesn't apply to me. Warog rumbled. He winced as he spoke. It certainly does. I said all, and I meant all. If I'd meant all the humans, I'd have said all the humans. Or maybe some of you, or you over there, or all you non-dragons. Or nonsense, Warg interrupted. Don't you know who I am? You're the dragon who caused a ruckus just now for no reason I can see, the escort dragon replied. And it's my duty and my job to take you into custody. When the trials are over, you can explain it to the king. And if I've done something wrong, well, I'll take what I've got, what I have coming. And if I haven't, you'll take yours. And all right, all right, Rog said. But I warn you, you regret this. That's as may be, the escort dragon said with dignity. Right now, peep. Right now, though, you're in custody. Right now, though, you're in custody along with the rest of these people. And, you, and you'd better not go snacking on any of them on, until things are sorted out. I saw what you did to the gray one. Did you? Then what are you going to do in this, about this chip in my sleeve? Tell it to the king, the escort dragon advised. Now off we go, the lot of you. Morwen came cautiously out of the bushes, brushing leaves about her from her already wet black robes. She stopped and peered at the escort dragon over the tops of her glasses. This has not been a good day for anyone's clothes, she said severely. I shall send the cleaning bill to your king. Whatever you want, the escort dragon said impatiently. Come on. Scowling furiously, Warog marched off into the forest. The stone prince and Eleonora followed, taking in, talking in low voices. Morwen paused to pick up the wizard's black rock and Cimmerine's pebble, then went on after them. Cimmerine hesitated. Go on, said the escort dragon. 
I will, but I think you ought to know that another batch of wizards is supposed to show up, Samarine said. Ziminar said something about a second shift. I don't know what what they can do without the stone they were using, but I'm sure they'll try something. Wizards always do, the escort dragon said with a sigh. He studied the wizard staffs that were lying around the clearing with a melancholy air. All right, I'll send someone back to keep an eye on things as soon as we get to the ford. Whatever was going on here, there certainly were wizards in it, and that's enough for me. Good, said Simmerine, and thank you. She smiled at the startled expression on the dragon's face and started after the others. <sighs> Need to make some nice hot mint tea. Okay. Chapter 15. In which the dragons crown a new king and Simmerine gets a new job. The walk to the fort of Whispering Snakes took longer than Simmerine expected. The trees of the enchanted forest grew close together in many places, forcing the dragons to take a zigzag path instead of heading straight up the bank of the river. Warog, who was in the lead, seemed to be deliberately setting a slow pace. Simmerine was sure he was hoping that the second shift of wizards would arrive at the Blackberry Clearing before the dragons at the ford could be, had been warned. She had no idea what would happen then, but she doubted that it would be good. The escort dragon was all not interested in Simmerine's worries, however, and he refused to speed things up, so the group ambled along. As they approached the ford at last, they heard cheering ahead of them. Warog flinched visibly, and Alianora and the Stone Prince were startled out of their quiet conversation. What's that? Alianora said. Sounds to me as if we have a new king, their escort said with great satisfaction. That means I can get you lot off my hands right away. What a relief! I thought I was going to be stuck with you for hours. Alianora looked faintly indignant with all, at this unflattering opinion. Morwen was merely amused. Warog's wings sagged momentarily, but then he seemed to pull himself back together and he continued on as confidently as ever. Simmerine's concern deepened. Warog, what if Warog managed to convince the new king what they, that they were all lying? They reached the edge of the cheering crowd of dragons. Who did it? The escort dragon asked. Who's the new king? How should I know? The other responded. I can't see a thing from way out here. You'll find out soon enough, the escort dragon said. Then he raised his voice and shouted, Make way! Coming through! Prisoners for the king, make way! The crowd of dragons parted reluctantly, and the escort dragon herded the group forward, still shouting. They made their way through the cheering dragons until they reached the edge of the river. Stand away, someone shouted and shouted someone in the crowd. Stand away for the king. The nearby dragons drew back, leaving Warog, the escort dragon, and Simmerine and her friends standing by themselves in the, on the trampled moss. As the dragons moved away, Simmerine caught sight of Kazul laying comfortably beside the river. Kazul! Simmerine cried and ran forward. Are you all right? A model dragon standing beside Gazul shifted his tail and flipped his tail angrily at Simmerine. You should say, Your Majesty, he said with a warning scowl. Don't be ridiculous, Frax. She's my princess, <sighs> Gazul said. I'm quite all right, Simmerine. What are you doing here? You're the new king of the dragons? Simmerine said in astonishment. But when you left this morning, you could barely fly. How did you get Colin Stone all the way from here to the Vanishing Mountain? Colin Stone apparently does more than merely pick out the right king. The Kizzle said, the minute I picked it up, I felt fine. This is impossible, Warog said. Are you accusing me of fraud? Kizzle asked mildly. He'd better not. 
Serene said. He's the one who is cheating with the help of Ziminar and the rest of the wizards. Really? Kozul said in tones of great interest. It's all nonsense, Warog declared. The girl's just trying to attract attention. Really? Kozul said again and smiled, displaying all her silver, silver teeth. Oh, come now, Kozul. Surely you won't take a mere princess's word over mine, Warog said. That depends entirely on what she says. Tell us about it, princess, Kozul commanded. So Simarine told them. She brought the stone prince forward to explain what he had overheard wizards and warog discussing in the banquet hall. And she made Alianora tell everyone about melting wizards with wash water and lemon juice. She told about getting to the Fort of Whispering Snakes on the first feather and being unable to convince any of the dragons to listen to her. She told about going to Morwen's house to find out whatever, where the wizards were and about using the last feather to get to the wizards and melt them. She described Ziminar's unexpected appearance and with subsequent melting, and the way Morwen had broken the wizard's spell, and she finished with an account of Warog's futile attack. And then he landed, Simmering waved in the direction of the escort dragon, and decided to bring us all back here. And I think somebody ought to go back to that clearing where the blackberries are between before the next batch of wizards arrive. I don't know what they'll do when they find out that what's happened, but... Yes, I see, said Kazul. She turned to a pale green dragon beside her. Take five or six of the younger dragons, the ones who've been talking about starting a wizard hunt, and go back and go have a look at the blackberry clearing. Yes, your majesty said the pale dragon with a fierce grin. Surely you don't believe this, Warog said. Kazul stared at Warog without saying anything, and the dragons around the edge of the circle rattled their scales. Uh, your majesty, Warog added hastily. Why should, why, I sh why should I disbelieve it? Kazul said, still watching Warog. The whole thing is preposterous, Warog said. How could wizard stone, wizards do anything to affect Colin Stone, your majesty? Kazul looked at Simmerine. I'm sorry, Kazul, Simmerine said, shaking her head. I know what the wizards were trying to do, but I don't have the slightest idea how they were doing it. I believe I can explain that, your majesty, Morwen said. She stepped forward, tossing and catching the wizard's black rock casually in her right hand. They were using this. I believe you'll find that it comes from the Caves of Fire and Night. From the King's Cave, in fact, where Colin Stone was found. And one of the properties of the Caves of Fire and Night is that you can use one piece to cast spells which affect similar pieces. Just the way that impossible book says, Simarine exclaimed. Demont Mercy? Marinci? Yes, I suppose he is fairly impossible, Morwen said. Is this sufficient? Gently similar to Colin's stone that the wizards could have affected the stone through it? Kuzul asked. Certainly, your majesty, Morwen said. This is... Warog began. Ridiculous, impossible, unbel and unbelievable, Kuzul said. You've said that already. And I haven't heard you say anything particularly convincing in support of that attitude. Oh, really, your majesty, Warog said. Next you'll be saying I poisoned King Toko's. It doesn't seem likely, Kazul admitted, since Tokos was poisoned with Dragon's Bane, and dragons can't get anywhere near the stuff without feeling the effects. What if Seminar made a Dragon's Bane proof packet for him to carry it in? Simrine said, thinking of the bag Antarell had been carrying when she and Eleonora met him in the valley. Something that would melt when he dropped it in the king's coffee. I suppose that's possible, Kazul said, but there's no evidence at all that Simonar did such a thing. What would it have looked like? Alianora asked suddenly. Would it have been something like a very large tea bag? So everyone turned to look at Alianor. I think that would have worked quite well, Princess, Kazul said. Why do you ask? Because Warag had something like that with him when he went to see King Tokos the night before the king was killed. Eleanor said, I saw it. 
An angry murdering ran through the crowd of dragons. Lies! Warhog snarled. They're all lies! Are they? Kazul said coldly. I don't think so. You must have wanted to be king very badly indeed. Uh, Warhog darted a glance around the circle of dragons. What he saw did not appear to reassure him. No! Consorting with wizards, killing the king, and plotting to cheat in the trials with Colin Stone, Kuzul said as if Warhog had not spoken. Hardly proper behavior for a dragon. The crowd muttered agreement. Serene looked from Warhog to Kuzul and back. Warhog appeared to be terrified of something, but Serene could not tell what it was. He crouched and seemed to shrink away from Kazul, drawing his wings in close and making himself as small as possible. Sumerine blinked. It was remarkable how much smaller Warhog could make himself look. In fact, he's shrinking! Sumerine exclaimed, No! Warhog cried again, but it was much too late. He shrank faster and faster, his wings melting into ridges along his back and his claws retracting. He was barely as tall as Simmerine's shoulder. Then, with a sudden shiver, he collapsed in on himself. A small rain of scales pattered to the ground. A moment later, an extremely warty toad with angry red eyes crawled clumsily out of the center of the pile. Is that... Is that Warhawk? Alionora asked in a hushed tone. The toad turned and glared at her, and she stepped back a pace. The stone prince put a protective arm around Alionora's shoulders and glared back at the toad. Behave, or I'll step on you, he said. Yes, it's Warhawk, Kozul said. She sounded almost sad. That's what happens when a dragon stops acting like a dragon. The to toad turned his glare in Kazul's direction, then hopped off and disappeared among the stones along the riverbank. Alionora shuddered. Kazul studied her for a moment. You were Warog's War princess, were you, weren't you? I'm sorry about all this, but it couldn't be helped. It won't take long to find you another dragon. I don't think you have to worry about finding her another dragon, Serene said. She had been watching Alionor and the Stone Prince, and an idea had occurred to her. What? Why not? Because the Stone Prince fought with Warog, and Warog certainly didn't win. Doesn't that mean that he gets to rescue Warog's princess? I'm not sure the rules cover this situation at all, Kuzul said, but it sounds reasonable enough, and under the circumstances, I doubt that anyone will object, unless, of course, she does. Oh, said Alionor, and blushed a rosy red. No, I don't object at all. Are you sure? The stone prince said anxiously. I, you won't mind waiting to mar waiting a while to marry me? I mean, if you're willing to marry me, you needn't, you know, if the idea doesn't appeal to you. It appeals to me very much, Alionor said, blushing redder than ever. But why do you say that we have to wait? The stone prince sighed. I still have to find a king and do him a great service. And that's bound to take a while. For a young man as intelligent as you seem to be, you're remarkably foolish, Morwen commented. What on earth do you think you've just done? An expression of astonishment spread across the prince's face. You mean the king I was supposed to serve is the king of the dragons? Exactly, Morwen said. And I doubt that you could do her a greater service than, have it, than saving the throne for Morag's pro plotting. That's settled then, Gazul said. Let's get the rest of the ceremonies finished and get back to the mountains. There's a great deal of work to be done. The dragons all bowed and eddies of movement began in various sections of the crowd. And shortly, two dragons came forward carrying Colin Stone. It looked like a, like a long black log about three times as thick as Simmerine's waist and twice as tall as she was. The dragons laid it in front of Kazul and backed away. Another dragon appeared. 
holding a large circlet made of iron with six spikes poking upward for, at intervals around the rim. Kuzul set her front feet on the black stone, and the dragon set the circlet on her head. The crowd of dragons began cheering again, and after a few minutes, they began forming a line to congratulate their new king and present their coronation gifts. Other dragons set up large tubs of wine and platters of meat and cheese, which were quickly surrounded. In the middle of the presentations, the dragons Kazul had sent off to the Blackbird Clearing returned, and Kazul took a ch short break from accepting congratulations to hear what they had to say. The wizard showed up before we'd been there more than ten minutes, your majesty, said the pale green dragon who was the leader of the group. Six of them, just like your princess said. They weren't happy to see us, the youngest dragon said smugly. I would think not. What did you do with them? We chased five of them away, the pale dragon reported. I don't think they'll be back either. Five? The pale dragon shot a glance at the youngest of the group who licked his lips and looked even more smug than before and said nothing. Yes, your majesty. I see. Well, that's more than enough evidence to confirm what Simmerines told us, Kuzul commented. She raised her voice. The arrangement between the dragons and the Society of Wizards is hereby cancelled. From now on, wizards will not be allowed anywhere near the Caves of Fire and Night, no matter what they say. Then she went back to accepting presents and congratulations from her new subjects. Simmerine watched the festivities with mixed feelings. She was very glad that Gazul was the new king of the dragons, but she couldn't help but wondering what effect the what, what effect Kazul's coronation would have on her own position. The king of the dragons certainly wouldn't need a princess as, as a mark of status, and there would be plenty of younger dragons eager to, eager to cook and clean for their king, if only as a way of getting a start at the court. Her preoccupation stayed with her for the rest of the day, through the entire coronation picnic, in the flight back from the Mountains of Mourning. Samarine and Alionora rode to, on the back of a very large dragon whose scales were such a dark green that they al looked almost black. Alionora would have preferred to ride with the Stone Prince, but none of the dragons were willing to take on a second passenger if the Stone Prince was the first. All of the dragons had paid their respects to Kazul at the coronation, so the cave was empty when the dragon dropped Samarine off. When Samarine said goodbye to Alionora, she promised to come over and pick, help her pack the following morning. When she went in, then she went in and waited for Kazul to come home. Kazul did not arrive until very late. She was still wearing the iron crown and she looked very tired. Thank goodness that's over, she said, taking the crown off and throwing it across the cave. It hit the wall and bounced off with a harsh clang. You shouldn't treat, treat your crown like that, your majesty, Simmerine said, retrieving the iron circlet. Of course I should, Kazul said. It's expected. That's why we made it out of iron instead of something soft and bendable. And don't start calling me your majesty. I've had enough of that for one day. <sighs> Simmerine began to feel a bit better. What happens next? Tomorrow we start moving, Kazul said and sighed. It will probably take weeks. It's too bad there's no way of warning a new king in time to pack everything up before the work starts. Everything? Simmering said in tones of dismay. Even the library and the treasure vaults? But I've only just got them organized. Everything, Kazul said. And if you think <laughs> straightening out things here was difficult, wait until you see the mess the official vaults are in. Oh dear, said Simmerine. Is it very bad? Kazul nodded. I've just come from looking at it. You'll see for yourself tomorrow. There's a smallish cave next to the library that I think will do nicely for you, but I'd like you to look at it before we start hauling things around. You mean you want me to stay? Simmerine blurted. But I thought the King of the Dragons didn't need a princess. Don't be ridiculous! Kazul said, how am I going to get my cherry's jubilee if I don't, if you don't stay? 
and you haven't even started cataloging the library, and how else am I going to get the king's treasure vaults arranged so I can find things? I'm not going to have time to do it. Won't the rest of the dragons object? Kazul snorted. I'm the king. One of the advantages of being king is that nobody objects to whims like keeping a princess when you're not supposed to need one. If it bothers you, we'll give you a different title. King's Cooking Librarian, maybe. Stop worrying and go to sleep. Tomorrow is going to be a very busy day for both of us. Serene smiled and went off to her rooms with a light heart. She slept soundly and was up early the next morning. Kazul is already awake and supervising three of the younger dragons who are packing up the treasure in the library. Since Simarine was pressed into service at once, it was several hours before she could get away to keep her promise to Alionora. I'm sorry I'm late, Simarine apologized when she arrived at Warrock's cave at last. But it didn't occur to me that Kazul would be moving too. Would be moving too. And she wanted me to help. It's all right, Alionora assured her. It wasn't as big a job as I expected. And the prince helped. I'm almost finished. She gestured to an almost full suitcase lying open on the floor. On the other side of the room, the stone prince was stacking the empty drawers from the from Alionora's bureau. Well, at least I got in here in time to say goodbye. You're staying with the dragons then? The stone prince asked, straightening with a frown. Are you sure you want to do that? Of course she's sure. Kazul's going to need her even more than she did before, and Simarine wouldn't be happy in a normal kingdom. How did you know that? Simarine said, staring at Alionora. It's obvious. Linderall, Linderwall is about as normal a kingdom as you can get. If you ran away from there, you wouldn't. You certainly wouldn't be happy anywhere like it. I didn't mean that part. I meant, Simarine said, reddening slightly. I meant about Kazul wanting me to stay. That was obvious, too, Eleonora said. You are the only one who was worried about it. She said, studied Simarine for a moment and shook her head. I wouldn't like bringing pin bring princess for the king of the dragons, but it will suit you down to the ground. I think it will, Simarine said, smiling. Then maybe you can tell me something, the, the stone prince said. What's being done about the wizards? They've been banned from the Mountains of Mourning, and there are a hundred or so dragons out checking to make sure they're gone. They haven't had much luck, I'm afraid. Most of the wizards left after the first few got eaten. That's all. What else can the dragons do? The wizards didn't actually poison King Tokos. Warog did that. So there's no justification for an all-out attack on the headquarters of the Society of Wizards, even if all the dragons agreed that they wanted to do it, which they don't. I suppose you're right, the prince said. But you better tell Kazul to keep a close eye on them. Those wizards will make more trouble just as soon as they figure out a way to do so, to do it. I don't know. I don't know about that, Serene said. I think Seminar was behind most of it, and you melted him. That's it, Eleonora said and snapped her fingers. I almost forgot to tell you. Warwin and I talked for a long time yesterday, and she says that melting a wizard isn't permanent. You mean they'll all come back? Serene asked. It will take them a while, Eleonora nodded. It will take them a while, though. And Morwen said for you to come and visit soon. She thinks that in a few days she'll have figured out a way of melting wizards without dumping soapy water over them. A mother method that's a little less sloppy was the way she put it. That will be useful if the wizards start making trouble again, Samarina said thoughtfully. Is this everything, Eleonora? The stone prince asked, gesturing to the suitcase. Yes, I think so. 
Eleanor has pulled the top of the suitcase over, and the stone print set one foot very gently on the middle, in the middle of it, and pushed uh, until the latch clicked. Where are you going first, his kingdom or yours? Zimmerine asked. Neither, Eleanor said, smiling. We're going to Morwen's. She said that she could change him back from stone to normal. We asked Kazul last night if we could go out through the Caves of Fire and Night, and she said yes, so... I don't know, Eleonora, the stone prince said. I'm beginning to get used to myself this way, and there are certain advantages. There are disadvantages, too, Eleonora said, blushing slightly. Simmerine began to giggle. Eleanor's blush deepened. I mean, uh, how are you going to get rid of that chip in your sleeve if you can't change clothes? I think I see what you're getting at, the stone prince replied, I and Eleanor meditatively. And you're quite white. There's no comparison. We had better see more one as quickly as possible. Eleanor and Simmerine looked at each other and burst into unstoppable giggles. The stone prince blinked at them. It's not funny, he said indignantly, which only made them giggle harder. Shaking his head, he waited for them to stop, then picking out, picked up Eleanor's suitcase. Shall we go? Simmerine walked with them to the iron gate that led into the caves of fire and night. A purplish, a purplish dragon was waiting to guide them through the caves. Kazul was no, taking no chances on Eleanor and the stone prince getting lost. Simmerine hugged them both and wished them a safe journey. And I hope you both live happily ever after. I hope you do too. Eleonora called back as she and the stone prince followed the dragon through the gate. Simmerine watched until they were out of sight, then started back towards Kazul ca Kazul's cave. She thought about Morwen and the wizard melting spell, and about Simonar and, Al and Terrell, and the other wizards who would somehow be back soon. She thought about Kazul and about straightening out the treasure vaults that belonged to King of the Dragons, and about all the hundreds of books in the King's library, and of all the problems that the King of the Dragons would have to deal with. She thought about Eleanor's last words and smiled. Happy, happily ever after? Simmerine wasn't sure about that, though she was certainly hoping to enjoy herself. She was positive, however, that life with the dragons would be interesting and busy, and in Simmerine's opinion, that would go a long way toward making her happy. Happily ever after? I don't think that's it's quite what you meant, Alianora, Simmerine muttered to the empty tunnel, but one way or the, another, I rather think I will. And that, my friends, is the end. The rest of the book is just a preview of basically the first chapter of the next book, Searching for Dragons. But, um, but yeah. So, like I said earlier, I will be reading The Misadventures of Catastrophe starting next week. Um, And um, it does look like the weather is going to, the, it definitely looks like the weather, weather is going to clear up in the next week. So, because yeah, we're up to 30 and tomorrow is a, is high of 34. Starting on Saturday, we're getting out of the freezing temperatures. So. So that's the thing. The, so that's the situation with that. And um, so yeah, 
Um, see y'all, see anyone who's interested in the D&D stream tomorrow. Um, I might load up Final Fantasy XIV. Um, it's debatable because my hands are kind of crampy because of the cold. And, yeah. So, I shall see y'all next time. Peace.